Miss <laughs> Mary. Hi, Hello. guys. How are y'all doing? Okay. We're doing good. How doing are you? Doing well. Doing well. Good, good, good. Good to see you. Yeah. Good to see you too. Is it still snowing? Wednesday. The Wednesday. snow's melting. Okay. You have more snow coming on Wednesday? A little bit, yeah. Oh, oh my man. goodness. We just had a thunderstorm come through. So yeah. It's melting though. It's pretty warm now, yeah. Yeah. What's pretty warm? Uh, 50. <laughs> that's not bad. That's, I wouldn't call it warm, that's but that's tough. not bad. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're still wearing coats in the fifties. <laughs> yeah, we wear oh. shorts in the thirties, right? <laughs> gosh, gosh, that's funny. Yeah, different perspective on things, right? Well, um, there's another couple that I thought might be coming tonight. I don't know if they're going to make it or not, but I since it's seven o'clock, let's just go ahead and get started. Okay. So if you guys want to go ahead and mute, so just so we don't have any odd sounds coming from the background. <laughs> and like my brother-in-law. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. All right. Let's start with a prayer. <laughs> Sorry, Kenneth. I didn't mean to throw you under the bus. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> All right. In the name right. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, for you have uh, created each and every one of us as unique individuals in your very own image. Lord, you desire that we have a relationship with you, and you are always there for us, and ask only that we open ourselves up to you, and that we come to you in all confidence. And we now pray as your son taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. St. Benedict. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, happy Feast of St. Benedict, everybody. It's, it's uh, as Benedict and Oblates, it's been another feast day for us. So it's just been feast day after feast day. And here in, uh, in uh, the Fort Worth Diocese, St. Patrick is our patron. So we got to celebrate as a feast day, St. Patrick's Day. And then, of course, St. Joseph's Day on Saturday, and then Sunday, and then now St. Benedict's. So, I told Robert, it's like, this is the most feasting Lent I remember, you know, really. And I mean, we've had all of those feasts before, but I think we really celebrated them all this year. So we've had fun. Now it's time to get back to Lent, I think. So, well, tonight <clears throat> we're going to jump into the second pillar of matrimonial spirituality, and that is prayer. So let me share my screen with you really fast, and then we'll dive right in. All right, there we go. All right, so why should we pray? That always gets me. Um, Philippians tells us in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your petitions be made known to God. So we should pray. Okay. We pray because God wants us to come to him. That was kind of the, the point of my opening prayer. Um, he doesn't step in as an intruder. You know, he, he is a gentleman. Um, he's not going to knock that door down. Uh, but he gladly comes to us when we come to him and invite him in. Um, and St. Matthew assures us of that. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. For what man is there among you of whom, if his son shall ask bread, will he reach him a stone? 
or if he shall ask him a fish, will he reach him a serpent? If then, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to them that ask of him? So, yeah, I mean, how much more plainly could it have been said, right? We just have to ask, and he's there for us. Now, of course, the response might not always be what we expect, but it will always be good. It'll always be better than what we ask for in the long run, right? Well, I love that scripture because it does, you know, a lot of times our relationship with the Lord is, is based, um, not based, is analogous to our families. And so I love the scripture, how it does talk about how we as sinful people are going to give what we can, the best we can to our children. Well, then of course, God, the father who is God, the father is going to give to us uh, when we ask to give us what we need. Um, it just, I love that whole analogy. So <clears throat> another reason to pray then is, to, is, for, t- is uh, it for temptation. Watch ye and pray ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So we can't do um, we can't do this thing called life without prayer because we will continually fall. And it is in prayer that we receive the grace to to help us to help us in those times of temptation. And Saint Alphonsus Liguori says something similar, and I really like this. Were you to ask? What are the means of overcoming temptations? I would answer. The first means is prayer. The second is prayer. The third is prayer. And you should, you ask me a thousand times, I would repeat the same. This is how we grow in virtue, how we get rid of our vice. This is, you know, one of the reasons for prayer. All right. So another reason to pray is for healing. If any of you is any of you sad? is any of you sad, let him pray. Is he cheerful in mind? Let him sing. If any man sick is any man sick among you, let him bring in the priests of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick man, and the Lord shall rise him up, raise him up. And if he be in sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess, therefore, your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be saved. For the continual prayer of a just man availeth much. So the Lord desires to heal us. He, you know, he doesn't want us locked away in anxiety and sadness and, uh, and fear and those, all that kind of stuff. We just simply have to ask him to heal us of those things, and, um, and he'll help us along, of course. In the inner stillness where meditation leads, the spirit secretly anoints the soul and heals our deepest wounds. That's about all you Healing. can say about that. <laughs> yeah, how, do you, how do you speak higher than uh, any more beautifully than St. John of the Cross? That's, that's prayer. Is his, his love getting into our soul and healing those wounds. Now, I would say the greatest reason to pray is for our salvation. <clears throat> and St. Alphonsus Liguori, he pretty much sums it up. Whoever prays is certainly saved. He who does not is certainly damned. All the blessed have been saved by prayer. All the damned have been lost through not praying. <clears throat> If they had prayed, they would not have been lost. And this is and will be their greatest torment in hell to think how easily they might have been saved just by asking God for his grace. But that now it is too late. Their time of prayer is gone. 
Now that doesn't shake you in your shoes. I don't think anything will. I mean, that is frightening. And when I first read this, I have to admit it did frighten me because I do know a lot of people that are good. You know, they get church going every Sunday they're in mass, but there's, you know, prayer is not part of their life. And I mean, St. Alphonsus Liguori, he lays it out there for you, for us. And so I hope, you know, that kind of helps us see um, the beauty of prayer, as well as the absolute necessity of prayer in our lives. Teresa Babila also said something very similar about um, those who do not pray are destined for hell. So that's just scary. I mean, that, that right there, just reason enough, I will pray. <laughs> well, I mean, you can see it as scary, or you can see it as, as encouraging as well. I mean, it depends on your perspective, I suppose, because it also says whoever prays is certainly saved. So, so if you're in the habit of praying, you know, keep it up. So those are all reasons of why I should pray, why you should pray. So now let's look, why should we pray as a couple? Again, I say to you that if two of you shall consent upon earth concerning anything whatsoever they shall ask, it shall be done to them by my Father who is in heaven, where there are two or three gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. The words of Christ himself, right? So um, the, the, powers, the, the power of the prayer of the two of you together is far more powerful than your individual prayers. Yep. In fact... There was a study done by the Institute for Family Studies. This is a sociological study that actually found benefits of couples for couples praying together. And these are what they found, that the couples had an increase in forgiveness in their marriage, an increase of emotional and physical fidelity, an increase in relational happiness, well, an increase in trust, an increase in unity, an improved conflict resolution, and it creates, I love this one, it creates a gravitational pull towards each other. So this is a, this is a sociological uh, study. This had, you know, had nothing to do with our faith or, or uh, any faith. And they found all of this to be the case of, um, for couples who are praying together. So beautiful reasons for us to pray together when all of this makes perfect sense because really there's there's no greater way to grow in intimacy together to really learn who your spouse is than by praying together you know because the longer you continue that practice the more and more you get to know each other the more open you become with sharing your your own personal struggles and conflicts with each other and and then you learn you, know, you learn the other person, you learn how to help the other person, the other person learns how to help you. So it, it's a great. And it can be kind of vulnerable, <clears throat> you know, Very because so. you're having to, you're having to, but at the same time, you want to share those vulnerable, um, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, those places within us that are not healthy, are not happy. That are, you know, wounds and, and, and hurts from our past, <clears throat> possibly from our spouse or possibly from someone way before our spouse that comes up in the marriage now to be able to share that in love with our spouse and ask them to pray with us about that. That can be kind of a vulnerable thing, but again, a very beautiful and intimate thing. So Cardinal Seurat speaks beautifully about this. <clears throat> when spouses pray together each day, their love is an impregnable stronghold. Look at that smile on his face because he loves marriage right there. <laughs> he loves married couples and he is he writes well about um, marriage and for married couples. So all right. So what exactly is prayer? Prayer is putting oneself in the hands of God. Mother Teresa. Sit with that for just a second and think about that. I mean, imagine yourself maybe possibly as a child 
wrapped, you know, in the arms of God the Father. Imagine the <clears throat> safe space that would be. Or wrapped in the wounded arms with the, the nail holes in his hands of Christ. The love that you would feel. To be in the hands of God. That is prayer. That's, you know, when you're in prayer, you kind of envision that and it puts you mentally in a beautiful place. So that's Mother Teresa. Well, let's look and see what St. Teresa of Avila said. Mental prayer is nothing else than being on terms of friendship with God, frequently conversing in secret with him. So it's, it's a conversation. It's not a method. It's not a a thing that we check off, okay, I did that today. It's, it's, a, it's a conversation with the Lord. <clears throat> and now the third Teresa, St. Teresa of Lisieux. Prayer is an aspiration of the heart. It is a simple glance directed to heaven. It is a cry of gratitude and love in the midst of trial as well as joy. Finally, it is something great, supernatural, which expands my soul and unites me to Jesus. I love this one too, um, because it is, again, it's a place outside of this world when we go to prayer. Um, I got to be up at Clear Creek this last weekend and the homily that was given on Sunday, he talked about how we forget in our world sometimes that there is a bigger world that this world is in, and that is the supernatural world. And when we go to prayer, that's when we can really somewhat leave this world and our soul and go to that supernatural world, that place of beauty with, in conversation with, with God. All right. So what are some of the different ways of praying? The great Bishop Athanasius Schneider says the essential dimension of prayer consists in personal contact with God. So it's not just a, a methodology, right? It's, it's this relationship. And um, as Catholics, I know growing up, you know, you a lot of times were, you'd hear the phrase, a personal relationship with God. And that just kind of disturbed Catholics because that was a very Protestant <laughs> thing to say, right? But that's what we're after. <laughs> I'm a convert. I was that Protestant. <laughs> <laughs> so... But that's what we're shooting for. And that's what prayer develops. You know, it, it's just like spending time <laughs> speaking with your spouse. Well, and again, this, this really nails this, um, a personal contact with God. So, you know, think about, think, ladies, think about being at home and your husband comes home from work and think about if every day he walked through the door, he came to you, he kissed you. Hi, honey. How was your day? My day was great. Hi, honey. How was your day? okay, I love you. And you walked up. I mean, that's the same thing you did every single day. That would be nothing but just kind of a habitual methodology. And there would really be no personal contact with one another in that. And so we, we got to understand that prayer is not just simply stating some words, but this personal contact that Bishop Athanasius Schneider is speaking about. So we're going to look at three forms of prayer and they build on each other and we'll kind of show you how they build on each other. Okay. The first type is, is vocal prayer. And of course, vocal prayers are just what they say. They're prayers that we vocalize. Uh, most of them are prayers that we've memorized. They're prayers that we learned as children. Um, it's kind of how we learn in the very beginning how to pray. And they don't know it necessarily have to be vocalized. They can certainly be prayed internally as well. Um, but it's things like uh, the grace before and after meals, uh, the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, um, the Hail Mary, the Angelus, the Rosary, the Creed, Confidior, and of course the Divine Office. That's maybe not one we would memorize, but uh, that certainly is a vocal type of prayer, um, especially, you know, when said in community. So as Robert said, these are kind of, this is kind of where prayer starts, is learning these prayers as children and 
and sometimes even as adults, we're learning these prayers, but understanding what they really mean, you know, that's part of, of the important part of teaching them to children is what do these words mean so that they're not just to memorize something and then they become just words rather than a communication with God, that personal contact. So the next type of prayer really gets into some good stuff and it's called mental prayer. Now let's look at the purpose of mental prayer first. St. John of the Cross says it's the end of meditation. The end of meditation and mental consideration of divine things is to obtain some knowledge and love of God. That's why we go into mental prayer. And I'll give you a little more um, explanation of what mental prayer is, but just looking at why it's important. It's when it's this time that we, we go into this conversation for the purpose of obtaining knowledge and love of God. And if you think about the old Baltimore Catechism that says, um, why did God create us? To know him, to love him, and to serve him. Well, prayer takes care of to know him and love him in terms of that relationship that conversation, that getting to really know him in prayer. Teresa of Avila says, I especially counsel you to practice mental prayer, the prayer of the heart, and particularly that which centers on the life and the passion of our Lord. By often turning your eyes on him in meditation, your whole soul will be filled with him. You will learn his ways and form your actions after the pattern of his. Mental prayer is a time of getting to really know the Lord and also yourself through the eyes of the Lord. It's a, it's a very intimate time. It's a, it's a much deeper type of prayer than, um, than vocal prayer. Mental prayer in general is an interior and silent prayer by which the soul raises itself to God without the aids of words or formulas in order to get to know him and to grow in union with him. So let's kind of look at the method of mental prayer. First, we need a sacred space. You gotta have a sacred space. And this is the one thing, this, well, not one thing. This is a one thing we are going to ask that you put on your, your rule of life is um, for prayer. And it can either be a, as your uh, personal in, uh, goal or your couple goal, but that you set up, if you don't already have one in your home, you set up a place somewhere in your home that is a sacred space. Because this sacred sp space is a place where you can put yourself in the presence of God, where that's what you do when you go there. This is our uh, sacred space. Just to kind of give you an idea, it does not have to be, you know, the full altered table and, and kneeler and all that. It can be something very small. Um, Just a table in the closet. Well, if it has to be that, yeah. I know we do know young one young man that that's where he set up his, his sacred space. He put a, a little table in his closet and put some, you know, crucifix on the wall and some icons and that's where he prays. Um, you know, I've worked with a lot of college girls that are in small little apartments or dorm rooms and they'll find just, I mean, a tiny corner in a bedroom and put, I know one couple, we actually got to work with them for their marriage prep. She sent me a picture. Um, uh, they had literally taken one of those plastic uh, crates and turned it upside down and then put, uh, we had sent them some tea towels that I had embroidered some different religious symbols on. And so they put one of those tea towels over the crate like a tablecloth and then set, you know, little uh, icons and a crucifix on it and that was it but that was their sacred space and they would go and just sit on the floor to do their prayer time so it can be anything it's just a, the point is that there be something that you find that place in your house that is for prayer that is your sacred space where you go to be in the presence of God well and, and it be reserved for yeah it be that. reserved for just that however I also know of some girls in dorm rooms that would um, have like a shoe box, a boot box that was like square. And so she took the lid off and in it, she had the cloth that she would cover it with and her little stand-up crucifix and her little stand-up uh, statues. And she would just put it on her bed and that would be her sacred space. And then she would have to put it all back in the box and put the box in the closet. So it wasn't something that could remain and be permanent, but it, that was her sacred space. She knew when she pulled that out and set it up, now I'm in the presence of God. I, and, you know, yes, it's true that God is always present to us. That's a given. But are we always present to him? 
And that's what that sacred space does for us is it gives us a place to be present <clears throat> to him, to be with him, to go to him. Um, it gives us, it gives us that space that is sacred, that is set apart to be with God. Okay, on with the method. The second part of the method is mentally putting yourself in the presence of God. So this is kind of an Ignatian um, practice, and he calls it um, imaginative prayer. And so what this means is as you go and you sit down and you kind of just relax a second, putting yourself mentally in the presence of God. What does that look like? I mean, I know one thing that I can do is go and just sit down in my sacred space and say, okay, where are we, where are we today, Lord? Where are we going to speak? Where are we going to talk? And it can be many different things. It's been um, at the foot of Jesus, at the feet of Jesus with Mary Magdalene. It's been at the foot of the cross with Our Lady, Mary Magdalene and John. It's been at the, the foot of Christ, um, uh, on his throne he's sitting on his throne and i'm at his feet um and then i don't know if you, any if y'all have seen the chosen if you haven't i couldn't recommend it enough it is an amazing amazing series and so there's one scene in there that's come into my prayer and there's a scene where he's sitting on this big boulder with john the baptist right beside the river jordan so there are times that in my prayer, I'm sitting on that boulder with him at the River Jordan, and it's, it's a wonderful place to be. And then there's kind of a new one that's come about that I really, really love, and it's, it's not with Jesus. It's with God the Father, and I'm more of a child sitting in his lap, and he's got his fatherly arms around me, and it's a place of safety. It's a place of security. It's a place where I know I am protected. It is a place I know where I am loved. And so that's kind of how you start this is you sit down and you take a breath and you just kind of relax. And then it's kind of like, okay, in my mind, in my imagination, where am I going to meet the Lord today? And it's, it's quite interesting. If you ask him that, where are we going to meet? Something will pop into your head. An image will pop into your head and it's kind of like, okay, well, that's where we are today. It's kind of, it's really neat. It's, it's uh, I don't know. There's something about my, personality that I love the excitement of where are we meeting today <laughs> it's just kind of a fun excite uh, a surprise so um so that's getting yourself in the presence of God so then the next one is once you're in the presence of God I'm sure you've heard this this term of Lexio Divina and this is a method of praying it's it's divine reading and this is very Benedictine um you know like in the very beginning of all of matrimonial spirituality we explained how it was taking from many of the saints and their spiritualities into our marriage spirituality. So that's kind of, you can see it very evidently in the methods of prayer. So you've put yourself in that place with the Lord and then you enter into Lexio Divina. Well, if we aren't sure what that means, the word pray is a beautiful acronym to kind of explain, explain it. So P is pray and ask the Lord uh, that you will be able to hear him. Please, Lord, let me hear you. Let me know you are speaking to me. The R is then read the gospel reading of the day, which is the very, the, the Benedictine way of, of doing that. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be the gospel of the day. It can, you can start with the very beginning of Matthew and take a small piece of Matthew every day and go through all four gospels. Robert, you did that, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did that. Um, but that gospel reading is just your conversation with the Lord. It's the subject that you will be talking about more or less. So then the A is ask the Lord to reveal to you what it is he wants you to consider. Um, it's, it's reading through it kind of with, it's like Benedict says, the ears of your heart and hearing those whispers, finding what is it that just tweaked my interest just the, the least little bit and aha, that's it. That's what we're going to talk about. Why? You know, what is it that you want me to hear here? And then finally, the why is yield to him and let him speak to your heart. Let him talk to you about, about it all. The key to Lexio is to remember you're in his presence. And this is a conversation starter, if you will. Um, he's gazing upon us. And he desires to communicate with us. So we read slowly and intentionally 
and even read the gospel passage even more than once if we need to and, and reflect upon that reading calmly and listening for his whispers. You know, you read this passage and just something in it just tweaks your interest the tiniest little bit. That's it. That's that thing. And this is the hardest part of mental prayer is learning to hear that little whisper because he's not going to just yell at you. Did you hear what I said about that lost sheep? You know, no, he's, he's not, it doesn't work that way, but am I the lost sheep? Is that who he's talking to? Would he come and get me if I were away from the fold? I mean, it's thinking through things like this. It's imagining yourself in the reading and you're either the character to whom Christ speaks, or maybe you're just standing beside, you know, watching from, from a, a little distance and watching his love, watching his miracles, hearing his teaching, but letting something in there connect with you in some way and let those feelings arise. I know my brother-in-law sitting there, Kenneth is probably going, oh, brother, <laughs> right now we're talking about feelings. Yes, we're talking about feelings because that's, that's, that's how the Lord speaks to us is he does connect with us. And so we let those feelings come to the surface um, as if you were there. As if you were there, if he were speaking to you and asking you to come down out of that tree because I want to have dinner with you. Or if you were standing by watching when he healed that leper. And if you were standing by watching, wondering, why is he doing that? Why is he healing that man? And watching the excitement of the man and being caught up in the moment of joy that this man <clears> has. <throat> being a part of it in that way and letting him give you the consolation that comes in those beautiful miracles or possibly something is said in a gospel that touches a, a spot in your heart that hurts. It hurts. Why? Why, Lord, does this hurt? What do you want to say to me to make this heal? What is it you're trying to share with me that will heal this? And so we let his love in that reading come in and touch our heart. And it does help heal. There is more healing of wounds done in prayer than in counseling. Isn't that a beautiful thing? When we just can quiet our souls, put ourselves in that sacred space so that it, what's around us is quiet, our souls are quiet, and we learn to hear him. We learn to hear those whispers those whispers of love, those whispers of healing, those whispers of guidance, those whispers of assurance, of hope. Those are all to be found in prayer. So the next part of the method is, well, the final part is ending in thanksgiving. Thanking him either for the conversation or the consolation that you were given, for the love that he offered to you or for any of the healing that was given or for any message of hope in your life saying thank you for that time, for that conversation, for that that he gave you in it. Okay. So the next form of prayer. The is, last form we'll talk about. The last yeah. form, yeah, is liturgical prayer. Uh, St. Francis de Sales of liturgical prayer says, in fact, to say it once and for all, there is always more benefit and consolation to be derived from the public offices of the church than from private particular acts. God had ordained that communion and prayer must always be preferred to every form of private prayer. Kind of goes back to that where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. So the Lord wants us to, he wants us to pray together. Of course, the highest form of prayer is the Holy Mass, right? We come together, we come to worship the Lord, to, uh, Worship him as the sacrifice is being represented to us uh, through the priest. And then, of course, the other form of, of liturgical prayer would be the divine office. Uh, or the liturgy of the hours. That's another the way hours, of yeah. saying it. Yeah. Um, but you can kind of see how these built, right? You know, you begin with the vocal prayer, which is just that, that vocal kind of surface. Um, kind of a childlike prayer 
not to say that vocal prayers couldn't be very deep and beautiful into your, you know, in your heart as well. But then you move into the mental prayer and the mental prayer is where the meat is in kind of this sandwich of prayer, if you will. And when you, when we really grow and learn that the, the mental prayer and how to do this and bring it into our lives every single day, then the Holy Mass and the divine office becomes something different. It is amazing. I mean, you are now able to enter into the prayers of the mass in a far more personal way with our Lord because you've learned to hear him in mental prayer. Now in the mass, you're hearing him speak directly to you because you've learned how to hear him in mental prayer. So mental prayer, it, it, it's necessary to get the most out of liturgical prayer. And the saints tell us, uh, Teresa of Avila, I mean, she says, never, ever, ever, ever stop mental prayer, ever. It's an every single day, getting this in every day because it's, it's the fuel of our life. It's, it's what fuels us. It's what prepares us for what's at hand in the day. Um, and then it takes us into the Holy Mass and into the divine office in a completely different way uh, than before we have begun mental prayer. Now, Bringing all this into marriage, there's a new term that we've just learned that Cardinal Seurat has, he calls conjugal prayer, which is praying together as a married couple. And it is so beautiful. So how do we do this conjugal prayer? Well, in vocal prayer, make a habit of praying vocal prayers together throughout the day. You know, begin the day together. Um, at least the very minimum, you know, before you split and go your way, separate ways in the morning, at least an Our Father, Hail Mary, and Glory be together, and then bless each other. That is, there is so much power in that blessing of each other because of the sacramental bond of marriage. Um, and it's just, it's, it's kind of like that bond. It's like sealing that bond of your marriage. So before Robert goes to work in the morning, he blesses me, I bless him. And it, it's kind of like, it's almost like marking each other for the other. You are mine and I am yours. And I will be praying for you today. You know, it's kind of, it says that um, after we've had our prayer time. So vocal prayers, at least, you know, do some, some form of vocal prayer first thing in the morning, you know, and then of course, grace before and after meals. Um, and then at least again, before bedtime, again, end your day in some form of prayer and that blessing of each other again, before you go to sleep at night. Okay. Kind of wanted to add on to yeah. that. We had a, uh, they called it a day of recollect, day of recollection for men this past Saturday that our pastor, uh, Father Harkins uh, did. And one thing that he mentioned in praying is that couples, especially couples with young children should make a make it a point to pray just the two of them and and you know and shoo the kids away they need to <laughs> they need to see mom and dad praying together praying together for each other for their family and he said of course little kids are gonna just by the nature of small children they're gonna want to be a part of that and the more you shush them away the more they're gonna want to be a part of that <laughs> So he said, that's, that's one purpose of it, but they just need to see mom and dad praying together. And of course he said later on when they're 10, 11, 12 years old, you're going to have to grab them by the ear and drag them in to pray with you to, to, to get up, keep them involved. But um, he was just stressing the importance of, of couples praying together. So now let's look at mental prayer as a couple. When possible, pray mental prayer together. It is an amazingly intimate experience. And how this looks is the same way. You enter into prayer, however you each individually enter into prayer. And in your mind, in your heart, you are in a certain place with the Lord. And then you share the reading of the gospel. And then you can both sit with that. You can sit with that and have your Lexio Divina personally but then share with each other what you received from the Lord in that. And it, it's such an amazing thing because what Robert shares with me builds on what the Lord gave me, you know, and what I share with him may build on what the Lord gave him. And it's just this unifying, beautiful relationship of three. 
in that moment of husband, wife, and God. And it's beautifully intimate, not only between the husband and wife, but the husband, wife, and God. He is such a beautiful part of that moment in the marriage, um, in that mental prayer time. So it's, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And so at least that's hard. That is very hard if you're still working people. So at least, you know, maybe try, say for instance, the gospel on Sunday, try to maybe do that sometime on Saturday or early Sunday morning before you go to mass, share that with one another so that when you then go into the Holy mass together, you already have a message, um, a conversation that's happened with God that then is built upon in the Holy Mass with the, you know, possibly with the homily. And then, and I know for me personally, when we've done that before, and then taking that into um, the canon or the, the liturgy of the Eucharist, it just, talk about supernatural. It is a beautiful experience where now what I am receiving has an even bigger, bolder, most be more beautiful message and, and connection with the Lord than I would have had otherwise. So it is a wonderful experience between, between couples to share that mental prayer and then take it into mass with you and into the divine office if you're praying any of the hours together. And I, that's another one that we absolutely love. And that's an everyday thing as we pray prime and compliment, which is the monastic hours would be the same, I guess, as morning prayer and night prayer in the liturgy of the hours. Um, that's another just beautiful unifying method of prayer that I know has benefited our marriage in a huge way. So, but that mental prayer adds to it. So that, that, that's the meat in the sandwich that's got to be there is that mental prayer and, and to like, make the others even yeah. bigger. And the weekend may be the only time you can do right. that because right. it can turn into a kind of a time consuming thing when you've got places to be that you have to be committed right. to. Right. You want to have plenty of time to relax and <clears throat> be with each other and with the Lord. You want to be able to share and make your conversation continues to go on and on and on you want to have time to be able to do that so cardinal Seurat really sums this conjugal prayer up in this quote it is not wrong to say that spouses who have put conjugal prayer at the heart of their lives have experienced an incredible renewal of their lives bordering on the miraculous for some couples be careful though in order to bear fruit Prayer must not be irregular, one day this way, one month that way. It is supposed to enter into everyday life as a communal meeting or two in the sight of God. A few minutes in return for an eternity of love. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> I just love that. I just love that quote because that is what it is. That is what this beautiful conjugal prayer in marriage is. It just it is this few minutes in return for an eternity of love. Um, so in closing, uh, right Reverend Dom Vitalis Lahodi in the Ways of Mental Prayer sums all of this up. And he says, God places the treasure of his grace at our disposal. And the key, and its key is prayer. Prayer is, it's a must. It's a must for the spiritual life. And I would say it's a must for a holy, healthy, happy marriage as well. It is. So, so um, let me stop share my screen and we'll um, never remember how to do this. There you go. Uh, in your, on your rule of life, I don't know if y'all have them handy and with you, but in the prayer pillar, you know, you've got an individual goal and a couple goal. And again, we really, really, really highly recommend the first goal is um, setting up that sacred space if you don't already have it. Figure out where in your house that can be the spot. So on the pillar of prayer, either figure that out together or decide one of you is going to do it, however you want to do that. So it becomes either the individual's goal or the couple's goal, however that works in your, your life and your timing. But that's the one between now and the end of Lent that we highly, highly suggest that you
get done and, and figure out is where are you going to put that sacred space that the two of you can pray? And it's a place where you can pray individually, but then it's also that place as a couple, you come together and pray. And again, if you're only beginning to pray, then you go to this sacred space and you pray your Our Father, your Hail Mary, and your glory be together. And, and amen, moving on. You know, it, it, it doesn't have to be a long, lengthy place, especially getting started. Um, and, and I think, you know, uh, Cardinal Seurat's statement that is key to it, though, is be careful, though, in order to bear fruit, prayer must not be irregular. It needs to become habitual. Every day. Yeah, not habitual day. to the point of checking off a checkbox, but just something habitual to the point of where you look forward to it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When you get into mental prayer, you do look forward to it. I, it's, it's beautiful. It's so you wake up in the morning and it's like you hear Jesus calling you. I know for both of us, that's the first thing we do when we get up in the morning after we get our coffee, the coffee has to go to our prayer, to our sacred space with us. Um, but it is, it is a time that you look forward to. So, and not everyone can do it first thing in the morning. Some people, that's what they want to do at the very end of the day and then go off to bed with that. And that's beautiful too. Um, it's, it's, you just have to find a place to build it in. And the saints, I know Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross and Francis Liguori all suggested um, starting with just 10 minutes, just 10 minutes. If you have no prayer, specific mental prayer time in your life already, start with just 10 minutes. And then you'll very quickly see you want more, you need more, you're going to be there a little longer than 10 minutes. And so, um, but we also are lay people and we do have to attend to the duties of our state in life because the saints tell us that's how we get to have it is in, by performing the duties of our state in life. And so we can't, we can't stay in prayer for two or three hours like the religious can. So we do have to, you know, maybe set that timer and cut it off and get on about our, our duties. So. However, like uh, St. Benedict said, aura et labora, right? Work and prayer. Yes, our, good, good our, thought. Our work can, everything we do pretty much can be our prayer. Yeah. Yeah, so. So I just read this about St. Francis of Rome and she was a married woman and she wanted desperately from the age of 12, she wanted to be a nun. And because she was of a, you know, a royal family, uh, what'd you say? Nobility. Yeah, nobility. Um, her father arranged a marriage for her and she went kicking and screaming. And so she would go after she was married to her prayer time and, you know, just be very upset when they would call her to her duties. And, um, and it was in prayer one, no, no, it was her sister-in-law. Her sister-in-law jumped in both feet all the royal things, all the balls, all the community things that they had to do. And, and it just really bothered Francis, with, you know, because she didn't want to do any of that. And so one day she asked her sister-in-law, how do you do this? I absolutely hate all of this. I wanted to be a nun. And her sister-in-law said, so did I, so did I. And she said, um, but I learned very quickly in prayer, the Lord said, when they call, you go, but take me with you. And she said, I very quickly learned if I just take the Lord with me, then I can stop praying immediately and go and do what they asked. And so St. Francis learned to do the same thing. And she said that was when she finally enjoyed being married because she could take the Lord with her to everything. Um, and then, in fact, she, it, this is what's really crazy, is while she was married, she established a Benedictine convent. She established it, but she stayed, you know, she was a married woman. But then when her husband died, she went and applied to join that convent, <laughs> the convent she started. So she then did become a nun after her husband died. But um, so that, I'm glad you brought that up because that as lay people is exactly what we can do is we get up from our sacred space and we take him into our work with us um, so that our whole day is a prayer. And it does make the day much better when we remember to bring Jesus into what we're doing. So it does take effort though. <laughs> it does take effort. Um, back to your rule of life. So on your prayer pillar, you want to, to write down you know, starting now till the end of Lent, for the rest of Lent, what do I want to work on to, to grow in my prayer life? Now, remember, 
those other pillars, the other four pillars are tools to help you in the, are the uh, yeah, they're not pillars. The other four tools are there to help in the pillars. So spiritual reading might be what you want to do as your individual goal for prayer. And it also counts for spiritual reading. So you might want to pick up a good book on prayer to help you grow in prayer. Um, this one book that I quoted from uh, Lahodi, The Ways of Mental Prayer is a wonderful book. And if, you're, if, if prayer and mental prayer specifically is a new thing to you, Dan Burke has a great book that's called Into the Deep. It's very short. It's very concise, right to the point, and really helps you um, grow and learn how to, to engage in mental prayer. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think seems like there was another one, but I can't remember what it was. I mean, then you get into the, you know, the deeper, richer writings on prayer. The interior castle, of course, is all about the prayer in the seven mansions of the soul. There's a great book by a Dominican called I Want to See God that kind of, it's bigger than interior castle, but it's kind of like a commentary on interior castle. It, it's, a, it's a good explanation. Um, so a little more meat on prayer and how to, how to do it and how to live it. Um, seems like there was another kind of more um, entry level book, but I cannot remember what it was right now. If you're interested, let me know and I'll be happy to put together a resource list of good books on prayer and kind of the levels of prayer. Um, so if, you, if your individual goal for the rest of Lent specific to prayer would be to read a good book um, that would also meet the, the spiritual reading goal on your rule of life too. Remember we talked last week about you may have the same thing in two different places because this tool is helping with one of the four pillars and that's fine. So um, I think that's it for tonight. Do you guys have any questions or thoughts you want to add? Anything that you can think of that I missed or we missed that you would like to throw in there. Um, if so, just feel free to unmute yourselves and, and you and tell us what you have. Um, and if not, that's okay too. <laughs> so, um, well, all right. Well, we thank you for being here. Um, I was really hoping for the big number three tonight because there was another couple <laughs> I thought was going to be here and then my Robert's sister and, and her husband have joined us tonight. So it's like, oh, yay, maybe we'll have three tonight. <laughs> hey, well, we're super excited to have two. <laughs> yes, we are. We're very happy that you guys came. And then, of course, all of y'all that watch this after the fact, we are so thrilled that you're watching it. And please feel free to email us if you've got any questions or concerns or anything. So right, let's close um, with the prayer. Well, next week, uh, same time, same place. And we'll be talking next week about virtues in marriage. So how to grow in virtue together. All right. All right. We'll keep it simple. We'll close asking for Our Lady's intercession. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. Amen. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Happy St. Benedict's Feast Day again. Have a great week. Yep. Hopefully we'll see you next week. All right. All right. God bless. Take bye care, bye. everyone.